بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أب القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك وعلى أهل بيتك المظلومين صلى الله عليك يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أَوَمَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا فَأَحْيَيْنَاهُ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا يَمْشِي بِهِ فِي النَّاسِ كَمَنْ مَثَلُهُ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ لَيْسَ بِخَارِجٍ مِنْهَا كذلك زين للكافرين ما كانوا يعملون صل على محمد وآل محمد Another salawat for the love of the Ahlul Bayt عليهم السلام Third salawat for the love of Aba Abdullah al Hussein. One of the greatest blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the human being. What Allah gave the human being to make the human surpass all other creation and be above all other creation is the power of the intellect that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave, gifted this human. The power of reason, the power to critically analyze and think and ponder. And with that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further blessed Allah honored the human being by giving him the power to choose. The power to choose right from wrong. This is also one of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. Allah says, we have given you, we have shown you the way. Either you want to live a life of Imam al Hussein, a life like Imam al Hussein, or you can choose to live a life like the life of Yazid. There's no force. And this is what makes Iman very important. This is what gives value to faith. Otherwise, if I'm forced in believing, if I'm forced to pray, if I'm forced to do whatever I have to do, then what's the value of that faith? What's the value of that worship? If I'm forced to pray, then what's the, what's the value of that prayer? 
Allah, if He forced me to pray, if He forced me to become a Muslim, if He forced me to do everything that I'm supposed to do, then that means that faith has no value. Here, during the days of Imam al Hussein, we learn about choice and how we have the choice and we have decisions to make. And it's the decisions that we make that either raise us or make us fall. Imam al Hussein, on the day of Ashura, it was an issue of choice. There was a group of people, 73 men, that chose to stand with the oppressed Imam of their time, and on the other side, there were 30,000 that stood to kill the Imam of their time and watch the Imam be butchered. It's all an issue of choice. Sometimes, it's difficult to make a choice in life. Sometimes making a decision regarding some issues, it's very difficult. But ultimately, we all have to make a decision. And ultimately, we are all headed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how I meet Allah, and what will happen to me after I meet Allah, my reward or my punishment, will be, will be determined based on the choices that I made in life. Our goal is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ya ayyuhal insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan famunaqih. You are striving towards your Lord and ultimately you will meet your Lord. Yazid met his Lord, Imam al Hussein met his Lord. But how did they meet? We are all striving to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But how are we going to make that choice? How are we going to make those difficult decisions in life? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala further bless the human being. Allah did not just give us the intellect and give us the power of choice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent signs. Allah sent signs to show us the way. Just like when you're driving, you need the signs to follow the way. Or else you will get lost. There are signs that show us the way and the greatest of the signs that show us the way to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Rasulullah and the Imam of our time. And every time there is an Imam, there is a leader that connects us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that shows us and takes us to the path of Tawheed, and without that Imam, even the simplest of issues, even the concept of Tawheed, it will be shaky. Because the Imamah, there's a direct correlation between Imamah and Tawheed. There's a direct correlation between believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and following the Imam of our time. And following the Imam of any time following the Imam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed for us. This is why it is very necessary in order for me to be on the right track, in order for me to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the right path, I have to know the Imam of my time. I have to know the Imam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent for me. Because if I do not know the Imam, then my faith will be shaky. Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasul wa ulil amri minkum. The same order that tells me to obey Allah, it tells me to obey the Prophet. And the same order that tells me to obey the Prophet, tells me to appoint the ulil amri, the leader that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed for me. Therefore, the Imam is connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Imam is connected with Tawheed. And if I do not follow the Imam that Allah appointed for me, there's going to be a problem with my Tawheed. And this is why we see numerous traditions. We see numerous narrations of Ahlul Bayt alayhum as salam and Imam al Baqir alayhi salam. This is a hadith narrated. By Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari, the Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He says, 
إِنَّمَا يَعْرُفُ اللَّهَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ The only one that knows Allah. وَيَعْبُدُهُ The one who knows Allah. The one who has reached the level of ma'rifah. And the one who worships Allah the way Allah orders him to worship him is the one مَنْ عَرَفَ اللَّهِ وَعَرَفَ إِمَانَهِ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْبَيْتِ The one who knows Allah and knows the Imam from the Ahlul Bayt And then he says, وَمَنْ لَا يَعْرَفَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ وَلَا يَعْرَفَ الْإِمَامِ مِنَّا أَهْلَ الْبَيْتِ فَإِنَّمَا يَعْرَفْ وَيَعْبُدْ غَيْرَ اللَّهِ And then he says, and the one who does not know Allah and does not follow the rightful Imam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed for him, this person is worshipping other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another hadith, by Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam, he says, يَقُولُ اللَّهِ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى أَوَمَنْ كَانَ مَيْتًا فَأَحْيَيْنَاهِ وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا يَمْشِي بِهِ فِي النَّاسِ Someone is dead, Allah gives him life. And Allah gives him a light so that he can see clearly. And then Allah says, there's another person, كَمَنْ مَثَلُهُ فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ لَيْسَ بِخَارِجٍ مِنْهَا And then there's another person who's living in darkness. He cannot see his way. Imagine walking without light. Imagine trying to find directions. Imagine trying to navigate without seeing. How difficult will that be? You will be walking in the dhulumat, walking in the darknesses. Laysa bi kharajin minha. And never will he leave from that darkness. The Imam says, Awaman kana maytan fa'ahyayna. The one who is dead is the one who is ignorant. The one who does not know the leader that brings him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَجَعَلْنَا لَهُ نُورًا يَمْشِي بِهِ فِي النَّاسِ We gave him a light so that he can walk, so that he can see clearly. He says, this is the Imam of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. Alayhum salam. This is the prophets that Allah sent. This is the Imam that Allah appointed. He is the one who shows us the path. He is the one who shows us the way. And of course, this is not something very strange. We see narrations that all Muslims accept. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, He says in a hadith, مَنْ مَاتَ وَلَمْ يَعْرِفْ إِمَامَ زَمَانِهِ مَاتَ مِيتَةً جَاهِلِيَ He who dies without knowing the imam of his time, dies the death of the pagans. Meaning that every time there's an Imam. And everyone has to know the Imam of their time or else their faith, there's going to be a problem with their faith. Now my dear brothers and sisters, do we know the Imams of our time? In order to reach Allah, we are supposed to know the Imams. Do I know the Imams? Do I know the life of the Imam? Have I, do I have na'rifah? of Rasulullah? Do I have true ma'rifah of Amir al-Mu'mineen? Do I know Imam al-Husayn Many of us, we only know Imam al-Husayn the last few days of his life. The last day of his life. That's all we know about Imam al-Husayn. We don't know anything else about the Imam. And we know a few stories when he was a child with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Imam al-Husayn's imamah it lasted for 10 years. What do we know? What roles did the Imam have? And this is a very important issue because if I do not know the Imam, then it will be very difficult for me to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to strengthen our ma'rifah, know the Imams, know our leaders, know the, our leaders that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed for us because they are the path that bring us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are some people, they don't know. They are very confused about the imams of their time, about the imams that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has appointed for them. Or 
We only know a few stories and we confine the Imam to those few stories. There are some people you ask them, tell me about Ali ibn Abi Talib. The only thing they know is that he was a brave man. Is this all Amir al-Mu'mineen was? Are we just going to confine him to a soldier? This man who was Medina to Ilm, he was the door of the city of knowledge of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Are we just going to confine him to one or two stories that we know about the Imam? Or for example, you see some people, they say Imam al-Hasan, he was a peaceful Imam. He was an Imam that did not want to cause bloodshed. But Imam al Hussein, on the other hand, he was a revolutionary Imam. Is this a true ma'rifah of the Imam? No. The Imams, we believe that they all were sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they had a mission that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave them. And Allah says in the Quran, وَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَئِمَّةً يَهْدُونَ بِأَمْرِنَا وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ فِعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ وَإِيقَامِ الصَّلَاةِ وَإِيتَاءِ الزَّكَاةِ وَكَانُوا لَنَا عَابِدِينَ Allah gave them a role and we confined them to a few roles. Where's the true ma'rifah? Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam, he had very important roles. While he had his imamah during those 10 years. Today I want to mention a few of those roles. The first role that the imam had, and of course all of the imams had, is that they were the exemplary monotheistic figures. They were, they were the proponents. They were advocating tawheed. And this was the mission of Rasulullah, and this was the mission of all of the prophets that Allah sent, and this was also the mission of the Imams. They called for Tawheed. At times where people were confused about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you see that it was the Imam who stood forth to clear up the confusion that there was in the people's minds. You see in Dua Arafah, one of the most beautiful du'as of the Ahl al-Bayt salam. One of the most beautiful du'as. And it is a du'a of Imam al-Husayn salam. In that beautiful du'a, Imam al-Husayn, he answers some of the great misconceptions that many people have regarding Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There are many Muslims that don't even know Allah. There are many Muslims that worship a God that they have created in their own minds. And we will come to it later on in the speech. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he answers this. You look at the Imams of the Ahl al Bayt, look at Dua Qumayn. You won't find Tawheed like the Tawheed of Amir al Mu'mineen in Dua Qumayn. You won't find devotion and worship. Today, some people, they go to Sufis and they go to others to try to find some type of spirituality. You don't need to go far. Go and open the book of the, the Mafatih al-Jinan. Go and recite Dua Qumayn. Recite Dua Arafah of Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam where he starts off speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, acknowledging who his Lord is, acknowledging who he is worshipping. الحمد لله الذي ليس لقضائه دافع ولا لعطائه مانع ولا كصنعه صنع صانع وهو الجواد الواسع فطر أجناس البدائع Beautiful words the Imam describes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the blessings of Allah and then the Imam he goes and speaks about the physical body of the human being. He says, oh Allah, you created me. You created me. I had bones, these delicate bones. You were the ones who created. And then you placed flesh on those bones. And then you put skin on that to protect me from the heat and the cold weather. The Imam goes very deep describing the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the Imam, he answers one of the most important questions that anyone can have in this life. 
And this is a question that many people have. Prove to me that Allah exists. Where is the proof for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is a question that many people ask. I need to see proof. I need to see a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. The Imam, he answers this in a very beautiful way. He says, كَيْفَ يُسْتَدَلُّ عَلَيْكَ بِمَا هُوَ فِي وُجُودِهِ مُفْتَقِرٌ إِلَيْكَ How can you bring someone something that's a proof to, bro to prove the existence of Allah when that thing in its essence is questioned? Everything that we see it has a beginning and it has an end. And when something has a beginning and it has an end, that means it is contingent. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the absolute. Allah is wajib al wujud. Allah was there when nothing else was there. So how can I use something to prove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah, He is the proof. He is the absolute. أَيَكُونُ لِغَيْرِكَ مِنَ الظُّهُورِ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ Is there something else that is more visible than you, O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is there something that stands on its own where I need to use it to prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? If I want to say the sun proves Allah's existence, the sun, there was a time that it was not there, and there's a time that it's not going to be there. If I want to say the human being is a proof of Allah, the human being, there was a time that the human was not there, and there's a time that the human will not be there. So how can I prove Allah when, when everything is contingent upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then he says, مَتَى غِبْتَ حَتَّى تَحْتَاجْ إِلَىٰ دَلِيلٍ يَدُلُّ عَلَيْكَ Oh Allah, this is a silly question for someone to say, let me see Allah. Because when did you disappear? When were you away that you need someone to navigate us towards you? And then he says, وَمَتَى بَعُدْتَ حَتَّى تَكُونُ الْآثَارُ هِيَ الَّتِي تُوصِلُ إِلَيْكَ When did you go far that we have to look for traces to bring us towards you? عَمِيَتْ عَيْنٌ لَا تَرَاكَ عَلَيْهَا رَقِيبًا وَخَسِرَتْ صَفْقَةُ عَبْدٍ لَمْ تَجْعَلْ لَهُ مِنْ حُبِّكَ نَصِيبًا Only the blind cannot see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah, although He is not seen through the senses, the heart sees Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the heart that sees Allah. And this is what the Imams of the Ahlul Bayt taught us. We study the lives of the Imams, we see that they invited people towards Tawheed. They called people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another event, the hadith says, خرج الحسين بن علي على أصحابه فقال أيها الناس إن الله جل ذكره ما خلق العباد إلا ليعرفوه Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being for what? So that they know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So that they can reach the ma'rifah of Allah Because when they know Allah فَإِذَا عَرَفُوهُ عَبَدُوهُ If they know who their Lord is, then they will worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just like Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, there's three types of worshippers. There is one who is the worship of the slave. This person is afraid of Allah, so he worships Allah. And then there's another person who is like the worship of the merchant. This person, he hears about heaven, he hears about the paradise, he worships Allah, so Allah gives him paradise. And then he says, and there is a group of people who have reached the ma'rifah of Allah. They know Allah. And when they know Allah, they know Allah is deserving to be worshipped. Allah, ahlun lil ibadah. Allah is deserving to be worshipped because He is my creator. He is my provider. To Him I will return. Therefore, there is nothing wrong with humiliating ourselves and humbling ourselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But yes, there is something wrong when I humiliate myself and humble myself to others. But not to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.
And then he says, فَإِذَا عَبَدُوهُ Once people begin to worship Allah, اسْتَغْنَوْ بِعِبَادَتِهِ عَنْ عِبَادَتِ مَا سُوَاهُ Once they worship Allah, then they will become liberated. Then they will become free. Because if I'm not worshipping Allah, then I'm going to be worshipping shaitan. And there's no other answer. If we are not worshipping Allah, then we are on the path of shaitan. Because there's only one path, there's only one haqq, and everything else is batil. Some people say, no, I don't worship anything. I don't worship a religion. Yes, you might not worship a religion, but in fact, you are worshipping yourself. You are worshipping your desires. And Allah says in the Quran, "Alam ahad ilaykum ya bani Adam an la ta'budu shaytan When I begin to worship my desires, when I go out the when I want to go out, when I dress the way I want to dress, when I speak speak to people the way I want to speak to people, when I legalize killing and oppressing other people, that means I'm worshiping my desires, and that means I'm worshiping shaytan. So there is only one path to be saved and that is worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the first role that the Imam had. The second role that the Imam had was that he guided people towards the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen, his father Ali ibn Abi Talib. Sallu ala Muhammad wa and when someone is guided towards the leadership and the wilaya of Amir al Mu'mineen, in essence, this person is guided towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Amir al Mu'mineen leads to Rasulullah and Rasulullah brings us to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why the, uh, in the verse in Surah Al Fatiha we say, Ihdina sirat al Mustaqeem. Guide us to the straight path. So when the Imam guides people to the path of Amir al-Mu'mineen, he is in fact guiding them towards the Sarat al-Mustaqeem. Why? Because we say, اِهْدِنَ الصَّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ صَرَاطَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ Guide us to the path of the ones whom you have blessed with your ni'mah. Who did Allah bless with his ni'mah? Allah blessed with his ni'mah in the verse in the Qur'an الْيَوْمَ أَكْمَلْتُ لَكُمْ دِينَكُمْ وَأَتْمَمْتُ عَلَيْكُمْ نِعْمَتِي وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا The day the ni'mah was complete upon the Muslims and the day the religion of Islam was complete was when? The day of Ghadir, the day Rasulullah stood and he took the hands of Ali ibn Abi Talib and he said مَنْ كُنْتُ مَوْلَاهُ فَهَذَا عَلِيٌّ مَوْلَاهُ اللَّهُمَّ وَالِمًا وَالَاهُ وَعَادِمًا عَادَاهُ وَانْصُرْ مَنْ نَصَرَهُ وَاخْذُلْ مَنْ خَذَلَهُ اللهم صلي على محمد وآل محمد So in essence, the path of Ali ibn Abi Talib is the path of Allah towards Allah and he is the صراط المستقيم وَإِنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلُ Allah says, there is one صِرَاط المُسْتَقِيم There is one straight path. Follow that straight path and do not follow the other roads. وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلُ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ The other roads, they will mislead you. There is one صِرَاط that brings you towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we follow the true Imam, we will be guided towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now someone might come and say, no, you Shias are very extreme. You say you only follow Ali ibn Abi Talib, or else you won't have true Tawheed. This is extremism. However, we see today, the ones who do not follow Ali ibn Abi Talib, Go and ask them to describe the Lord that they worship. Go and ask them to describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will tell you Allah has a body. They will tell you 
using verses of the Quran, وَجُوهٌ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ نَاظِرَةٌ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَةٌ Today there's a big group of Muslims that say on the Day of Judgment, there is going to be a group of people, the people of paradise, they will be able to see the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah says, وَجُوهٌ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ نَاظِرَةٌ Taking the literal meaning of the Qur'an. And there's a hadith, I was reading it today. It says that a fabricated hadith, of course, we do not accept that one day there was a full moon. Rasulullah was looking at the moon and then he told the Muslims, you will look at the face of Allah in paradise on the day of judgment. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he was asked about this. He was asked, will people truly see Allah on the day of judgment in paradise? Will the mu'mineen see the face of Allah? The imam, he said, it is very sad that someone lives on the land of Allah. And he eats from the food that Allah has given him. And he drinks from the water that Allah has given him. And everything that he has is from Allah, yet he does not know the Lord that he worships. Allah says in another verse, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ There is nothing that resembles Allah. Allah does not have a physical body. But you see the ones who do not follow, who do not take their tawheed from the Ahl al-Bayt, a group of them, not all of them, they will conclude that Allah has a body. So here you see there's a problem with the tawheed. And ironically, who are the ones who are accusing the Shi'as of being mushrik? Who are the ones that are accusing us of being mushrik? Why? Because we go and stand in front of the grave of Rasulullah and we say, Assalamu alayka ya Rasulullah. And this means that we are worshipping Rasulullah. No, we are not worshipping Rasulullah. We do not worship the Ahlul Bayt. We worship Allah. It is Rasulullah and the Ahlul Bayt that direct us and guide us towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You see that it is those groups that accuse the Shia of being mushrik, they are the ones who in essence, their God that they are worshipping is like a Greek method, uh, like a Greek God. You know the gods that in Greek methodology they talk about? This one has a body and this one does this and that. So we see that it is necessary to it is necessary to know the Imam of our time because the Imam connects us with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of that, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he would guide people towards the path of Amir al Mu'mineen. He would tell people to follow Amir al Mu'mineen. In a time where Ali ibn Abi Talib was cursed on the mumbar, you see this mumbar? There were scholars. There were people that used to stand for the Jum'ah prayer and this was legislated by Muawiyah until the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So it took on for many years, 80 years. The Khatib, he would stand on the mimbar in order for his Salat al-Jum'ah to be complete, he would curse Ali ibn Abi Talib. What does Imam al Hussein do during that time? He stands and he praises Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because this is what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi did. And Rasulullah, he said, Dhikru Ali in ibadah. Mentioning the merits of Ali ibn Abi Talib is a form of worship. Why? Because when you mention the merits of Ali ibn Abi Talib, you're not going to follow the enemies of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And you're not going to follow the group of people that killed the Ahlul Bayt. And today they're causing bloodshed. Those are the enemies of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Go and read, go and do as much research as you want. You won't find someone who loves Ali ibn Abi Talib, who considers himself a follower of Ali ibn Abi Talib, that goes and kills innocent people. That goes and shoots innocent people in a masjid, in a Husayniya, people that are worshipping, people that have not done anything wrong, he goes and he kills them. Where do you find these people? Where do you find these people like Daesh, like Al-Qaeda, like Taliban? Where do these people come from? Are these the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib? Are these the ones that cry for Imam al-Husayn alayhi salam? 
No, these are the enemies of the Ahlul Bayt. So this is why dhikru Ali and Ibadah, because when you mention the merits of Ali ibn Abi Talib, you're not going to become a terrorist. And of course, I'm not saying all of the people who do not mention Ali ibn Abi Talib go and become terrorists. Please do not misunderstand me. But the group of people that have hatred towards Ali ibn Abi Talib, yes, they do become terrorists. The Nawasib, the ones that hate and have hatred towards the Ahl al-Bayt salam. So this is why Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, he mentioned the merits of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And one thing that he did was that he named all of his sons Ali. And all of his daughters, he named them Fatima. And there is a saying that Ali ibn Abi Talib said, if I had a thousand sons, I would have named them Ali. And you know why Imam al Hussein was killed? It was because he was the son of Ali. On the day of Ashura, Imam al Hussein he told them, Have I oppressed you? Have I done anything to hurt you? Have I stolen from you? What have I done to you? Why are you all fighting me? Why do you all want to kill me? They told him, We kill you because of our hatred towards your father, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And until today you see their sons and their lineage, where they have hatred towards Amir al-Mu'mineen and the followers of Amir al-Mu'mineen. Another role that Imam al Hussein had was that he exposed Muawiyah he exposed Muawiyah and he let the world know who Muawiyah was. He says, Wallah inni la a'rifu fitnatan. He sends a letter to Muawiyah. He tells him, Wallah inni la a'rifu fitnatan. Amarru ala al ummah min wilayatika ala ummati Rasulullah. I don't know any conspiracy, any disaster that has fallen upon the ummah of Rasulullah. Like that, where a man like Muawiyah takes power and he leads the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Muawiyah, he killed tens of the Sahaba, hundreds of the Sahaba. In the battle of Safin, thousands of Muslims were killed. Many of them were Sahaba. It was a battle that was waged by Muawiyah. He killed some of the noblest companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And then today we, the Shias, are accused of attacking the Sahaba. Go and look at what Muawiyah did. He killed some of the most important Sahaba. This was one of the roles of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And another role. And finally, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam taught people spirituality. He brought spirituality to people. And this was, of course, all of the Imams. But you see the beautiful du'as of the Imam, the beautiful munajat of the Imam. They say that on the day of Ashura, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, as the wounds were getting thicker and thicker on his body, it did not bring him away, it did not distract him from remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His face was glowing, they say. A few men, they came to kill Imam al Hussein after he had fallen. They came to kill him. They saw that his tongue was moving. His body cannot move. His body is broken. His body is filled with wounds. They say that there was a thousand wounds on his body. They asked Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, how can it be for someone to have a thousand wounds on his body? He replied, he said, It was the same spot that was struck more than once. But despite all of the pain, Despite all of the agony that he was going through, 
Imam al Hussein during those last moments, they say his face was glowing and his tongue was moving, remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. After he fell from his horse, the narrators they said we heard him reciting Ilahi Taraktul Khalqa Turwan Fi Hawaka wa Aitamtul Ayal Likay Araka Fellow Katani Bisafi Urban Lama Hanal Fuadu Ila Siwaka Ilahi Ruban Bikabaik Sabran Ala Balaik لا معبود سواك أغثني يا غياث المستغيثين إمام الحسين عليه السلام he shows love during those final moments he teaches people how to connect to Allah and have spirituality even in the most difficult moments and in one other du'a of Imam al-Husayn, the du'a of Arafah, he says a very beautiful statement. He says, Ilahi taraddudi fil athar yujibu bu'd al-mazar fajma'ni alayka bi khidmatin tu siluni ilayk. He says, Oh Allah, there are many distractions that bring us away from you. When I start to think about something to prove your existence, this is in fact a distraction. Let me do something. فَجْمَعْنِي عَلَيْكَ بِخِدْمَةٍ تُوصِلُنِي إِلَيْكَ Let me do something so that I can serve you in the best way possible. Let me do something so that I can reach you in the best form possible. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered the dua of Imam al Hussein by granting him the shahada on the day of Ashura. And this was the ultimate sacrifice. This was the best form of worship, the best form of ibadah, and the best way to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. On a night like this, we remember how Imam al Hussein departed from Medina, the city of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa After news came that Imam al Hussein, after news came that Yazid had took power, he ordered for the Khali for the Wali, for the governor in, in Medina to take bay'ah from Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. But Imam al Hussein, he cannot give bay'ah to a man like Yazid. So he tells him, I cannot give bay'ah and I refuse to give bay'ah to a man like Yazid. But he realized that his days in Medina were over. He goes to the grave of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He begins crying. This is the final time that he visits his grandfather, Rasulullah. He begins crying. He says, Ya Jad, Ya Rasulullah. Oh, grandfather, you know what has happened to me. They want me to give bay'ah to a man like Yazid. I cannot do that. Rasulullah. He tells him, Imam al Hussein, he sleeps for a moment over the grave of his grandfather. Imam al Hussein tells him, Ya Hussein, Ukhraj ila al Iraq, Fainni Iraq muramalan bidimak, Madbuhan min kafak, Wanta ma'adalik atushan la turwa, go to Iraq. For I see that you will be butchered in the land of Karbala. However, Ya Hussein, inna laka and Allah, maqam la tanalu illa bishad. You have a position in the eyes of Allah that you will not reach that position except through martyrdom. Imam al Hussein, he said his farewell to his grandfather, Rasulullah. Then he went to the grave of his mother, Fatima, that hidden grave. Imam al Hussein used to always, in times of difficulty, go to his mother's grave, who he lost her at a very young age. 
but at least he was close to her grave. Now he has to say his farewell as he is leaving Medina. Imam Al Hussein he takes the caravan with him. This was one day when Imam Al Hussein left Medina. All of the men, the women, they were all together. However, there was another day when a caravan came back to Medina without Imam Al Hussein, without Abul Fadl Al Abbas, without Ali Al Akbar, without Al Qasim, even without the six-month-old child of Imam Al Hussein, alayhi salam. Where Bishr ibn Hadlam, he enters Medina and he begins mourning Aba Abdullah. Ya ahla ya thrib ala mukama lakum biha aqtil al Hussein fa admu'i midraru. Al jismu minhu bi karbala mudar rajun wa al rasu minhu ala al ghanat yudaru. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون <تصفيق>